Good morning again. It's good to see you. We're in Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read an extensive passage, verses 11 through 22. We're going to talk this morning about the peacemaker. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, when you find it, please stand to your feet if you do not have a copy of Scripture. It's on the screen for you to be able to read along in silence. This is the word of God. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who is made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Beloved Father, please speak to us through your infallible word. We ask you in Jesus' righteous name, amen. You can be seated. We're going to talk about peace this morning. We're going to speak about the peacemaker. And as those angels of God announced to the frightened shepherds of the glorious news of the birth of Jesus, they turned their gaze upward and they spoke these eternal words to God the Father. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Your marginal reading and your King James and New King James Bibles, as well as the main text and other translations says, peace to men of goodwill. May I say to you this morning, that such a reading would make peace to be an exclusive thing if it were only peace to men of goodwill? Because the purpose of the cross this morning was to make peace and goodwill for all mankind, not just those men and women of goodwill. God does not just save good people. God saves vile and violent people. God saves blasphemers and bums. God saves pimps and prostitutes. God saves drunkards and drug dealers. God saves drag queens and druggies. God wants peace toward all mankind. All men, all women, everywhere. 
Sometimes I fear that we forget what it means to be lost, ladies and gentlemen. Let me reiterate that for you from the very verses we read in our text this morning. We were without hope, without Christ, without the promises, and without God. We were separated and sentenced. The claim of death was stamped on the books of our lives. Then one day came Jesus, who reached down and snatched us from the grip of death. He brought peace where there was no peace. And that's what we want to see today, peace. I want to show you, ladies and gentlemen, as we speak of this and the peacemaker, first I want to bring your attention in verse 14 to the Prince of Peace. The Bible says, He himself is our peace. He is our peace. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prince of Peace is the Savior of prophecy. He shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's the Savior of prophecy. He's the one to whom the scepter belongs. He's the Passover Lamb. He's the High Priest. He's the water in the desert. He's the prophet like Moses. He's the commander of the army of the Lord. He's the kinsman redeemer. He is the suffering servant. He is the soon coming king. He is Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. He's the prince of peace of prophecy. The prince of peace is the savior of promise. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Being justified by faith, we now enjoy the peace of God. The Prince of Peace is a savior of a peace, of a kind of peace that was postponed, that has been postponed. You may be saying in your heart, you just showed me a promise of peace, peace with God and the peace of God. And you're right. I did. Somebody told me about a man who died, but before he died, he wrote out his will. As it came time to probate the will, and the lawyer read it, and there's his wife seated there, and the will said he left nothing to his wife. So the woman had a tombstone made, rest in peace until I come. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's the opposite with the Lord Jesus. When he comes, he brings a peace that the world seeks and the world cannot find at this moment. He's looking for it. The world looks for it, but it only comes when the Prince of Peace returns. There's a bit of rivalry today between the Arabs and Israel. And it's going to continue until everyone says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The wars that ravage the continent of Africa will continue until the Lord Jesus returns again. The battles and the skirmishes between drug lords and Latin American governments are going to rage on until the return of the Prince of Peace. And it is then that the swords will be beaten into plowshares. It is then that the wolf and the lion and the lamb will be able to lay down together. It is then that a little child will be able to lead them after the Lord Jesus comes, returns in his second coming. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Prince of Peace. But oh, I have to tell you something. He brings peace 
But there is a great price for his peace. Back in your text in verse 13, the Bible says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the price for peace is the price of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know a single man or a single woman who can adequately explain this great price. No song can capture the depth of the truth of the blood of Jesus Christ. But God, God took that sinless, spotless, precious blood and with it wiped out the sins that are written against you and with it paid the terrible price for your sins and for mine. And with that blood, that precious, precious blood of Jesus, he took us who were far off and he brought us near. There was the price of his body. Verse 15 tells us that he abolished in his flesh the enmity, the price of his body. The Bible teaches us, and we must learn this truth, that the price for peace was not gained only on a metaphysical level in a war between good and evil. Some people think it was just a spiritual battle. I want you to know the Word of God says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5, it's a quote from the Old Testament, a body you have prepared for me. It was a body born in a stable. It was a body that felt cold and heat. It was a body that needed rest and food and clothing. It was a body that felt the piercing nails and the whip and the thorns. A physical body that suffered a physical death and enjoyed a physical resurrection and will come back in a physical return, ladies and gentlemen, the price of his body. Why did he do this? The text tells us the purpose of peace in the rest of the verses from 15 and following. The first thing I want you to understand in verse 15, he did it to abolish that fatal hostility. That's what the word enmity means, ladies and gentlemen. Hostility. Isaiah 57 teaches us there is no peace for the wicked. One man was out sharing the gospel and he ran into a man and he said, you got peace in your heart? And the man said, look at my house. I have this wonderful house. My wife can buy whatever she wants to buy. Look at my driveway and look at my cars. Look at my bank account. And the man said, but do you have peace in your heart? He said, look at my children and the colleges that they went to. Look how well they're dressed. Look how well I'm dressed. And the man insisted, but do you have peace in your heart? And he finally said, the man looked at the, the preacher looked at the man and said, look me in the eyes. Look at me right now. Do you have peace in your heart? And the man finally broke down and he said, no, I have everything you could want, but I don't have peace. Ladies and gentlemen, our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who came to bring peace to the heart. There is no peace for the wicked. There is only hostility for the wicked. The unsaved man or unsaved woman, the unsaved young man, the unsaved young woman, the unrepentant child old enough to understand these words that I speak this morning is considered to be an enemy of Almighty God. That person occupies hostile territory. You say, that's terrible that you would say that to me. That's horrible that you would make such a statement like that to me. I want you to know, I didn't say it. Almighty God says it in his word. So if you want to shoot somebody, don't shoot the messenger today, please. I'm just reporting the truth to you as it's written. Someone once asked a man what it was like to be a Christ follower. He stooped to the ground and he found a worm. 
And he grabbed that worm in his hand and he held it in his hand and then he made a little circle with leaves and with twigs and he dropped that worm in the middle of that circle. Then he pulled out of his pocket some matches and he lit those leaves on fire and those leaves began to burn. In just a few moments time, that worm could feel the heat. And that worm squirmed its way like worms do towards one way, but he felt heat. And so he went back the other way and he felt heat. And he went a third way and he felt heat. So he returned to the center where the least amount of heat was and he curled up waiting to die, just waiting to die. The man reached down into that flame and pulled that worm out. And he held that in his hand. He showed it to the other who asked him what it meant to be a Christ follower. He said, I was that worm. I was surrounded by the flames of hell. And a nail pierced hand reached downward and snatched me out of it. And brought me to a place of peace. The Lord Jesus Christ abolishes, ladies and gentlemen, the fateful hostility against us. He makes peace between you and between God. He did this to give you access to the Father. Look at verse 18, please, if you would. Through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. There are places, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot go. There are people I cannot see. There are doors through which I cannot pass. But there is an open door for me and for you and for every Christ follower into the very presence of God the Father, of God Almighty. And I can speak to him and enjoy him 24-7. Doesn't matter the hour. I will tell you this. You may not like it. You may not appreciate it. But there are times that I won't answer my telephone. There are places I'll be that I'll ignore my telephone. Send your text messages at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to answer it. Not at that hour. You need me. You may have to persist in ringing. You may have to come to my door and knock on my door. But I want you to know if you need me, I'll be there. But there are certain rooms if you try to call me, Kevin ain't answering. Certain times... The phone doesn't ring, you know what I'm saying? But not so with Almighty God. You say, you're a terrible pastor. So be it. Not so with Almighty God. Not so with Him. My Father is available 24-7. No matter what it is, I can tell Him of the little things. I can tell Him of the big things. I can tell Him of the joyous things. I can tell Him of the sad things. I can tell Him of my plans. I can tell Him of my dreams. I can tell Him of my failures. And He'll still listen even when I fail. If I say, Lord, I blew that one, didn't I? He'll He'll say, yeah, you sure did, but come on in here. Let's talk about it a minute. And he'll just invite me right into his glorious presence. He gives me through Jesus Christ. I have wonderful access to the greatest, the most powerful, the Lord God Almighty. But you know what else he does? He gives me acceptance in the family. Look at verse 19, if you would please, in this passage of Scripture. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God. I have acceptance with the family all the way around. There's a lovely theme that rises out of this all the way through the passage. He made both one, he says in an earlier verse. That's the theme of unity. There's no us and no them. It's the theme of unity. Christ followers are all one body and one family. Last night we had our Spanish worship and we met in one of the homes of one of the members rather than coming here to this great building to have our worship time. There were 30 of us and there were three that were missing. 
No, four that were missing last night. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't God good in what he's doing? Why, we're talking about people from Peru, people from Puerto Rico, people from Venezuela, people from Colombia, people from Cuba, people from Honduras, from all around. We were a group of nations. We were many, but we were one together. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I are many, but we are one. There is no red and yellow, black and white in the eyes of God. Forget melanin. We are one in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. I'm telling you, folks, we have acceptance in the family of God. To make you also, this is what he did, an addition that fits on the foundation. That's how the chapter ends for us. In verse 20 through 22, we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and you and I are living stones placed within the foundation by the living God and kept by the Spirit who lives within us. That's the purpose of peace. Now let me tell you how you have peace. Let me tell you the plan. It's really simple. You know it already. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This baby that we celebrate in December became a man, a sinless man without spot. And he was crucified and buried and raised again the third day because of your sin and mine. And we are called to believe on the name of the Lord. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You must believe. You must repent. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, the Bible says, repent and be converted. I know some folks that have believed, but they've never repented. They know everything you can know about Jesus, but they've never turned away from sin. We have reached a point where grace, Chris, listen to me, man. Make sure they understand this in Serbia. Andrea, make sure they get this message. Grace is not cheap. Grace is not cheap. It's not. And we're called upon to turn from sin, to repent, and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are too many that think, I'll believe, but I'm not turning my life over to the Lord. I'll believe, but I'm going to keep right on with my lifestyle. I like my lifestyle. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know when you come to Jesus Christ, you must turn from sin. Amen? You must do so. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. There are people who have repented, but they do not believe. There are people who have said, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to stop this and start that. But they've never believed on the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, don't fall for that line either. That's not the way the Word of God is. Repent and believe. But there's one more word. One more word that's very important. And it's that word receive. John 1.12 said, as many as received him, to them he gave the power or the authority or the right to become sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. You must receive into your life the Lord Jesus Christ. You know this, and I've shown you this a dozen plus times since I've been here in more than eight and a half years where I've said to you, the Lord Jesus comes knocking on the door of your heart. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hear my voice 
and open the door. I will come into him. You must repent and you must believe. I received a phone call not long ago from an individual who said, please run by the hospital. There's a woman there. Her, my cousin is her cousin through marriage. And we don't know if this woman is saved. Y'all, she's from Richton. She's from Richton. I didn't know that when I went. I didn't know anything about her. I showed up in the room, and you can imagine, who is this stranger walking into my room? It's obvious I wasn't a chaplain. I didn't have the little tag on. I didn't have any identification. I did reach in my pocket and pull out one of my business cards, and I said, this is a strange story, but I'm the pastor of 38th Avenue Baptist Church. Where's that on 38th Avenue? I'm the pastor, and I've been asked to come and to speak to you. And I spoke to them of this very passage that we're speaking now and shared with them the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I said to them, now when I knocked on your door, what did you say to me? And they said, we said, come on in. And I said, I did, didn't I? Did you have to say it twice? No. I came on in. Do you need to say it again now? No. You're in here. Good. Good. Let's talk about this. And I spoke to her about this wonderful truth. Not just her. She had two daughters with her. I just love it when God gives me a captive audience. And I shared the gospel with those individuals in that moment. And shared with them what it meant to receive into their life the Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, you must do the same. You must open the door of your life and you must, by an act of your own will, choose to receive Jesus into your life. As many as received him, as many as welcomed him into their life and say, come on in, I want my life to be your life. I want you to be comfortable here. And by the way, that repentance word comes into play because Jesus, Jesus not, he doesn't play with sin. You all know what I'm saying? So that repentance word comes in real important right there. But he tells you, invite me in. Let me be part of your life. That's what he wants to do. There's a story about Lord Nelson. Lord Nelson, as you know, Admiral Lord Nelson, great Admiral of the British Navy and he was involved in a battle with the French and he defeated the French. The general came to the ship and the general came dressed out, the French general, in all of his regalia, head to toe. And he had on his side, he had his buckler and he had on his side his sword. And he walked up and he reached out his hand to shake hands with Admiral Nelson. And the admiral stepped back and put his hands behind his back. And he said, sir, before I shake your hand, you must lay your sword down at my feet. And the general took off his sword and he laid it down at his feet. And he saluted. And Admiral Nelson offered his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, have you laid your sword down at the feet of Jesus? Have you come to the place where you're no longer the enemy? Where you've surrendered and you've laid your sword down? And you've said, Lord Jesus, here I stand. I want peace with you. I surrender to you. Have you come to that place? Because that is the place that the Lord's calling you to today. That's what he calls you to peace. Our Savior, Jesus, He Himself is our peace. Father, what a truth that you've given to us in the Word of God. What a truth for this Christmas season. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace 
goodwill toward men. Oh, glory, Father, thank you. And there are those present this very morning who need to lay down the sword of hostility against you. They need to lay it down at the feet of the Prince of Peace. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you, that you will illuminate hearts through the Holy Spirit to understand this call that the Holy Spirit has upon us. Make it clear now, Father. If you need Christ Jesus to forgive you of your sin and to be your Savior this morning, you tell him in your heart or with words aloud, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm at hostility with you. I'm your enemy, but today I want to surrender. Today I want to Declare Jesus to be my master, my Lord, my commander. I surrender to the one who died for my sin. I surrender to the one who can forgive me. I surrender to the one whom God raised from the dead. Please come into my life and change me forever. I surrender. I surrender. Come into my life, Lord. If you'll pray those words, my Lord, my God, He'll forgive you. He'll answer you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He'll do it. If you've done that in a moment, as we sing this final song, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and to tell me or Brother David, today I surrendered. Today I invited Jesus into my heart. And we'll show you what the next step is if you'll do that. If God has told you that this is your place to connect with Him, to transfer your membership, you do so as well. Father, bless this invitation. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.